This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome aboard, folks. Dr. Charles Parker here one more time for... This, is gonna, this meeting is going to roll your socks up and down, folks. This is not a casual meeting. It's going to be delightful. Our guest is a very entertaining, extremely bright guy who has a whole different perspective on comprehensive medicine. Dr. Zach Bush, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. And Dr. Chuck, just thrilled to be on with you, and I'm just so pleased at what you do in your patient population there in Virginia Beach. Thank you so much. Now, so what we're going to do here is – Uh, talk a little bit about our sponsors on the front end. I hesitated for a moment because I'm so eager to talk to them. I had to jump back to, okay, I've got to wear my sponsorship hat a little bit and get that done. So we'll do that first. And then I'm going to introduce Dr. Bush to you. Zach lives in Charlottesville. He's a Virginia brother. (laughs) And what happens is he has a whole system of understandings with a specific way of approaching uh, maladaptive neurophysiologic activity that you may not have heard about. It's going to be well worth the shot this evening. So with that, I'm going to mention, first of all, Core Brain Journal is supported by Direct Health Access Laboratory with over 3 million studies. They're deep leaders of experience with a big picture of measuring, for example, methylation, cryptopyrrole, and copper challenges it's all molecular physiology. They provide a global service with a molecular focus. So see more laboratory details at DHA Lab, that's plural, DHA, uh, not plural, is what I would say, DHA Lab singular, dot com forward slash core. And Core Brain Journal is also supported by the nonprofit Barry Robinson Center teams in Norfolk, Virginia where they provide residential care on an evolved family, interpersonal, and they are also global because they're very TRICARE friendly. Check out their innovative comprehensive programs at barryrobinson.org forward slash core. That's B-A-R-R-Y robinson.org forward slash core. So let me go ahead and introduce Dr. Bush to you folks. And by the way, I'm going to take some of his videos and put them on the page. So if you don't get it when we're zooming along here, you'll be able to catch Dr. Bush on the page here at Core Brain Journal. But Dr. Bush is one of the few triple board certified physicians in the country with expertise in internal medicine, endocrinology, and metabolism, as well as hospice, hospice palliative care. I mean, the guy has remarkably deep comprehensive training. The breakthrough science that Dr. Bush and his colleagues have delivered offer profound new insights into human health and longevity. In 2012, he discovered a family of carbon-based redox molecules made by, get this, bacteria. He and his team subsequently demonstrated that this cellular communication network functions to compensate for glyphosate and many other dietary, chemical, and pharmaceutical toxins that disrupt our body's natural defense systems. You've heard more about this in previous episodes. Dr. Bush has some serious answers. This science has resulted in a revolutionary class of dietary supplements, including the product Restore, which you'll hear more about later. Dr. Bush points to his kids as the driving force behind his passion for change. He is fiercely motivated by a desire to have them experience a much brighter and healthier future. His education efforts provide a grassroots foundation from which we can launch a change in our legislative decisions, ultimately upshifting consumer behavior to bring about radical change in the mega industries of big farming, big pharma, and Western medicine at large. Uh, Dr. Bush is available at ZachBush.com, ZachBush md.com. We'll talk more about it later. Zach, again, thank you so much for coming on board. How did you get 
so deeply into three board certifications. <laughs> I mean, you know, you are a compulsive learner, fella, and I, I'm the same way, so it's so much fun to talk to you. How did it happen to you? Uh, by accident. <laughs> <laughs> um, and certainly, uh, I hesitated to even go into medicine at the beginning. I was going to be an engineer uh, because I didn't like school that much. I was not planning a medical school, and when I decided I needed to go into the health and healing industry. I was thinking maybe RN or maybe a physician assistant or something, but you know, learning is, is a slippery slope. You start to, to learn something and then open up your eyes and uh, suddenly it, it makes you ask questions. And, and the worst thing about learning is it makes you ask more questions. Then you get real curious. And then the worst thing you know is suddenly 30 years of your life has slipped by and you're still <laughs> taking tests and learning. <laughs> and and so, then after all you've learned, you still miss it once in a while. And you say, oh my gosh, I got to I, I got to pick something else up here. What is you know, the it, it's something else? So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna, uh, I've gotten to the point now in my education where I realize I'm never going to feel like I reached the end of anything, yeah. and every day is a new day to learn. And it's a it's a beautiful journey. I love the fact that um, you know, as dismal as uh, the Western medicine education ends up being, I think that uh, there's a great hope and opportunity to say, wow, we're just scratching the opportunity to start to learn what health, human health looks like. And so it's a joy. Yeah, it is. And, and right now is a transformational time. There's absolutely no question about it. I mean, I think this confluence of uh, educational opportunities is taking place both with functional medicine and traditional medicine, where absolutely. these two uh, disciplines come together as opposed to, hey, we're so far apart, we can't talk, to how do we talk together and really take the peer-reviewed evidence, the good science on both sides, and actually put it together in a package that's going to work for humankind down the road. Absolutely. I love it. So tell us about the next step, which is we want to jump right there into the gut with you. I think that you have so many interesting things. Honestly, it's been hard for me to pull it all together because some of the things you're talking about are not familiar to me. And so I know they're not familiar to our audience. So we're looking forward to hearing about your journey in from endocrinology, internal medicine, down to the relevance of gut for brain function, if you could. Yeah, um, I'll try to nutshell that one because that was about 10 years of my life. But uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, So the journey looked something like, um, you know, in clinic, I was seeing a lot of obesity, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, cholesterol problems, heart disease, amputations from peripheral vascular disease and neuropathy and all of the typical decline that we're seeing, unfortunately, in, in vast amount of the American public. And under the microscope in my, in my laboratories, I was studying cancer and researching the mechanisms by which you know, neuroendocrine cancer happens and how we could perhaps use some very unique nutri nutrients like vitamin A to kill those cancers. And so cancer research and kind of that end in one spectrum and then the diabetes and metabolic and hormone disorders on the other. And over the course of a couple of weeks and, and you know, suddenly about 10 years ago, everything kind of came to a confluence. I'd been under the microscope staring at some cancer cells and suddenly realized I was running late for clinic, ran over to my clinic, jumped in my white coat and popped in like I was a real doctor and, and said, you know, hey, I'm Dr. Bush. And it was a new patient. He had this huge diabetic ulcer in his ankle and it was infected. And so I was debriding this thing uh, in clinic, trying to just give this guy some hope of not having to go to the operating room to get his foot uh, removed. And uh, so I was debriding this thing, trying to figure out how deep this wound went. And suddenly, looking at this necrotic tissue and its relationship to the healthy tissue around it, realized I was looking at exactly the same thing as I had just been looking at on the microscope with cancer cells, abutting healthy cells. And suddenly realized that, oh my gosh, what, <laughs> if this is the same thing, is there is anything different? Maybe every disease is actually the same thing. And in a nutshell, that's what happened is you suddenly realize, wow, my, my training had put me in all these different things and triple board certified in all these little different areas, blah, blah, blah. That makes it sound like I was learning lots of different things. And I was, I was being told everything was different. And then I was told that, you know, for those 10,000 different disease processes, there's 100,000 different drug options for you. And this is what it means to be a doctor and a healer. And by this time, I'd been practicing medicine long enough that I'd realized that no matter how many drugs I put on my patients, they seemed to get worse, not better. You know, I was really driving them down the wrong avenue with insulin and things that seemed natural, thyroid hormone, insulin, estrogen. These seemed like naturally occurring compounds that could never really, took me a long time to figure out why I was making my patients worse, not better often. 
And uh, so in that confluence, you know, take a step back and the answer is, hold on, where there is really no such thing as all these diseases. We created those diseases by large part in recent years to, to allow physicians to bill you for your, for your care. And so you come into the doctors, we need to give you a CPT code or a diagnosis code that then we latch to a, a code that we uh, charge for. And so it's really this kind of arbitrary system of categorizing disease and treatment that's led to this belief that everything's different and everything's got its niche and you need to go see a gastroenterologist if you have a gut disease and you can go see a psychiatrist if you have a brain disease, a kidney doctor if you've got a kidney problem. It's just divided us all up into these little tiny slices of human body. So true and so well said. And so that's really, you know, been a lot of that journey is to kind of divorce myself from that belief system, really start to re-engineer my own education and my own clinical practice to say, what if there's only one thing? Maybe the one thing is a lack of health. If your body starts to lack health, then it gives the opportunity for disorder and disease to crop up. And that's a much different question. Well, then what is the underpinnings of health? And that was the startling reality in 2008, 2009. I suddenly realized I have no idea. I I've been learning forever, and I do not know what health is. I don't even know the mechanisms of health. I don't even know. What, I mean, I had a sense of well, maybe I'd tell people eat healthy, but honestly, at that time, I didn't even really know what that meant. I, I thought, well, maybe low fat or low sugar, and I didn't know what a healthy diet would look like. And I, well, maybe they should exercise. Well, I didn't really know what the best exercise routine was. I'm mean, not taught that as a doctor. I you send somebody to the physical therapist so they got a knee problem, but as far as really understanding and why would exercise help? What, what is it about exercise that makes a healthy human body? What is it about food that could, and so suddenly realize, man, I don't, I don't, this is why my patients are having bad outcomes. I don't know anything about health. <laughs> and so yeah. that, that's kind of a dismal reality of, you know, Western medicine at large is, wow, we just spent a hundred years pouring billions and trillions of dollars into medical research and research and development of drugs for disease management. And as a group, we, we have very little clue as to what human health is composed of and how we would teach our patients, let alone our, you know, practice it in our own lives, to become healthy individuals. So uh, if that answers your question, that's, that's the beginning of it. And uh, I guess the end of it is I I've set out in 2010. Uh, there's a very impoverished community here in Virginia. It's called Beckenham, Virginia, and it's a food desert. And uh, kind of fifth generation poverty in a lot of areas of the county. And I thought, well, if I could figure out how to help th that group and really move some health there. And part of it was probably out of insecurity. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't ready to go to Santa Barbara, California and tell them to eat healthy because they <laughs> knew all about juicing and everything else. And <laughs> yeah. I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. Yeah. So I set out to start a nutrition clinic in a food desert that it doesn't even have a grocery store. I figured, well, I can only go up from here. <laughs> <laughs> Good thinking. <laughs> And so we started this nutrition center and, uh, you know, it's been an amazing journey over the last seven years. We've made a lot of discoveries, uh, and that largely, you know, we have busy research and development labs and everything else because I started to realize that as I delved into nutrition and tried to start to learn this to teach my patients, I started to realize nobody knows what they're talking about in nutrition. We haven't ever actually applied all of the knowledge that we have of basic science, cellular biology, genomics that has not been applied to this day effectively to the world of nutrition. It's a very antiquated 150 year old practice that we're doing in the world of nutrition. We believe that what's on a plate, oh, there's some cheese. Well, there's some calcium in cheese. There's some casein in there, some protein fat. That must be what gets into your body if you eat it. That, that ends up being absolutely not true, but that's how, you know, that, that hasn't changed in 150 years, our belief system about nutrition. So we're behind the times and, uh, so now my lab is really full-time into understanding what is the relationship between the food, the bacteria, and the microbiome in your gut, that relationship to the gut lining where you produce an enormous amount of your hormones. A lot of your brain regulation comes from that gut lining and the rest. So there you go. <laughs> well, you know, that's a big deal. You know, so because the issue is what you're saying is there's a series, there's a confluence of activities. And most people have been thinking that this thing about what's on your plate you're exactly right. I mean, it's a massive amount of denial. I was telling you earlier this whole thing about how many times a day you go number two. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm further along in my career than you are, and I've been innocent much longer than you have and had so many treatment failures doing what I thought I was supposed to do in a correct 
board certified way. I've had three board certifications in psychiatry myself. I let two of them last because there was no sense in keeping up with them. They weren't, yeah. the, the crew was not where I was. So why would I go down and spend the money to continue to hang out with them when they were going to tell me stuff that was so limited, I just had to let it go. So, uh, you know, I did addiction medicine. I did forensic psychiatry as well. It's like trying wow. to find some kind of an answer with the whole thing. And I got trained in child and adolescent psychiatry. So I didn't board in child, but anyway, that's because I just, at that point I was studying psychoanalysis. I did seven years yeah. of training in psychoanalysis. So there's a certain point where you say, how come I'm not getting this right? Yes. You know, you have, you know, I learned in, in addiction medicine, the guys in AA had some great phrases. One of them is, when you blow it, you eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. And that, like was, it. That, was a, that was a transformational moment for me because I think it was the humility in that statement is, is a really big point. And you've said a couple of humbling things about yourself because you know, when you realize the limitations of all the work that you've done, the time you've spent, the patients you've seen, and you see the limitations, then you start looking, what am I actually missing? And, and what you just said very quickly is volumes. I mean, to actually put that together, we don't have enough time to do it this evening. But I would like to ask you to focus a little bit, because it is Core Brain Journal, uh, a little bit on that whole thing of neurotransmitters, the gut, and then what you developed in the process of putting restore together and how that restore works, all those sort of things, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, let's start maybe with just a definition of gut health. Uh, it's something that doesn't exist in the literature right now. So we have gastroenterologists and we have hundreds of GI gastroenterology journals around the world on the science of the gut and all this not a single one of those has a decent definition of what is gut health. It's not something you're taught. It's just we talk about diseases of the gut. That's what we talk about. Gut health is something that um, I'll define for you right now. There's basically, I'd say, three major pieces of gut health. There's, it gets more complicated if we wanted to go into the minutia, but three major pieces of this is you have to have an ecosystem on lying on before the gut. And so you, your front lines of defense in the human body aren't even human. The bacteria, the fungi, even the viruses that live in this milieu of this ecosystem of over probably 30, 40,000 species of bacteria would be ideal. I think we're walking around with, in a lot of cases, a tenth of that. Um, or 5 million species of fungi. I think we're walking around with a tenth of that. Or, you know, hundreds of millions of species of viruses, 300,000 species of parasites. I mean, the size of this microbiome that we're surrounded by dwarfs the human imagination. It's, it's something beyond our capacity to really understand the complexity of this beautiful ecosystem. But for your brain to start to wrap around this, maybe you've seen a jungle on TV or a, a coral reef, or maybe you've been to the jungle or you've gone scuba diving or snorkeling. Imagine that coral reef and all of the different types of bacteria and fungi and all of the microbial life that lives in, in the coral that creates the colors and then that has more bacteria and fungi that live on that and then you have little tiny microorganisms that eat that and fish and, and then the fish are swimming around and, they, and then there's whales and you got just this whole speed, you know, ecosystem from micro to macro in a, in a coral reef. And interestingly, your gut looks like coral reef. It's got these long, you know, finger-like projections that come out and stick out into the ocean water, or in this case, the bacterial biome of, of your gut, where all the food is passing and nutrients are exchanging, and you've got water exchanging through the system and being absorbed into the body, and electrolytes. It's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful coral reef-like environment that a healthy gut is. So number one, you need that diversity of life. Number two, you need a very distinct boundary between the bacteria and, and the food and the inside of the body. And that boundary system of the human body is a macro membrane. It's a large membrane made up of over a trillion human cells. It's called epithelial lining. And it starts at your na nasal membrane and runs all the way to the rectum. And so you've got this huge membrane that covers, if you were to stretch it out, two tennis courts in surface area. Massive. Compared to your skin, your skin only has one and a half meters of surface area. That two tennis courts, you've got this massive surface area, and it's protected by this tiny little thin membrane. It's actually only half the width of a human hair. So pluck your hair, 
imagine cutting that in half and now that's the thickness of this cellophane like layer that separates your body from the outside world that's pretty terrifyingly remotely tiny <laughs> you know you have this <laughs> microscopic boundary that is the only defense between the bacteria the fungi and the chemicals in your food the chemicals in your water the pollution in the air you breathe etc cetera, etc cetera. and so gut health is huge biodiversity and then a very intact membrane. You want this membrane to be intact and turning over quickly. You want it uh, in an ideal situation, every 72 hours, your whole gut lining is re re rebirthed. And so you want the constant renewal and regeneration of that cellophane layer of protection. Step three to gut health is you want to make sure you have very robust defenses behind that. And there's an immune system that lays behind your gut barrier system and that is called the GALT or gastrointestinal associated lymphatic tissue. That's where some 80% of your antibody production is made and that's probably 60 to 70% of the entire immune system sitting right behind that cellophane layer of gut lining. If you have some injuries in there and you have a little bit of a breach of the wall and you get a little bit of invasion, your immune system activates, dumps some oxidant to kill any bacteria that may have gotten through, clean up the mess, clear some of the toxin, make an antibody to any foreign proteins that may have gotten in, et cetera. If you start to overwhelm that immune system and you're starting to leak all over that gut, now you get a big inflammatory response and now you've lost gut health again. So those are the three areas we can really lose gut health. Number one, the bacterial biome, fungi, et cetera, the microbiome. Number two, barrier system. Number three, immune system sitting behind that. So that's kind of your general architecture. Now you asked very specifically, because we're with the core brain journal here, where is the brain? What is the brain? The brain is an incredible network of neurons. And these neurons have you know, billions of connections to the, not just the, the brain in your head, but in this peripheral brain of the peripheral nervous system, we have billions of connections of dendrites connecting out and they're sensing the world around you. The brain itself is just a pile of mush. It's, it doesn't, have any sort of intelligence in and of itself. It's, there's no, the only time it starts to have any activity that would equate to intelligence is its ability to absorb all of this information from the peripheral nervous system that's sensing your surroundings and then start to channel that into experience or learning. And so my brain that contributes to my learning process is simply just a central processing chip that's taking in information, processing it and putting back out information to the words that are coming out of my mouth or my touch on a patient's back or you know, whatever it is. And so that, that brain we have come to think of as being kind of the, the big system that runs the show. You happen to be in an area of psychiatry and you've been for your you know, decades now, you've been ex experiencing this incredible journey of how humans can thrive or kill, literally kill themselves by the activity that's either present or lacking in the brain itself. It's been an extraordinary journey, and this journey started back in 1998 kind of time frame when I first got interested in something called psychoneuroendocrinology. And so it was mm. my first signs that maybe I had a schizophrenic approach to my <laughs> professional development. <laughs> but, uh, this psychoneuroendocrinology was the study of how does psychological disease occur from neural changes that are in response to our endocrine or hormonal system. So I'm almost 30, you know, what am I, that's 20 years into that journey of kind of understanding there's that, there's a relationship between those three events or those three clinical manifestations. It was an amazing moment that a few years ago came to realize that all three of those, the psychology and the psychiatric disease or health, the neural system and the hormonal control system were all dominated in its presence in the gut lining, not in the brain. That's a huge, amazing reality. You've maybe read journal articles about, you know, or even in the lay press, you see articles now about the importance of the microbiome and blah, blah, blah. But what we're really saying here is it's not a gut-brain connection. The gut is the brain. In a lot of ways, the gut is starting to realize, whoa, we, we, we actually don't even have a brain. We just have a gut that then uses the brain to process all of this information. To give you a sense of how ridiculous this, this kind of imbalance between gut dominating the brain is, is you've likely heard of the, the, warm, the neurotransmitter serotonin. Yes. Serotonin, obviously, uh, even in the lay public, has been popularized by the drugs, which are serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. The famous one was, of course, Prozac and then Zoloft and all these other SSRIs have come onto the market. Well, what they do is they block the reuptake of serotonin from the synapse between the nerves, 
and that leads to an increased uh, concentration of serotonin, so you get more signaling, and that leads to an improved um, mechanism of kind of our reward system or our sense of uh, wellness. When your serotonin levels drop, you tend to get a decreased sense of wellness. You start to start to question self. You start to question your own value. You start to question, you know, why are you here? All of these intense kind of existential questions that plague us as humans start to come to the forefront, and then we can slip into sleep disorder and depression and all kinds of different dysregulation of the brain. Amazingly, serotonin is now recognized to be produced 90% in the, in the gut. 10% of your serotonin is made in your brain. That's a ridiculous reorganization of our understanding of gut versus brain. Suddenly we start to realize the gut is the manufacturing center. It is the production center for the neurotransmitters that will make you feel well. Interestingly, that entire mechanism of production is not happening in some big cell like a neuron. A neuron is huge in comparison to these tiny little epithelial cells. Remember a single neuron, or maybe you haven't heard this before, but a single neuron can reach from your back. Your low back, for example, will have a, a, a neural body, and it will extend an arm one meter down all the way to your toe and innervate the tip of your toe. One nerve. And so that's a huge cell that can have a meter-long projection. Mm -hmm. In contrast, your epithelial lining of your gut is made up of cells that are roughly half the width of your human hair in both directions. And so we have these tiny, tiny little cells that then abut an endocrine cell that lines the gut. And we used to think that the whole gut was just these barrier cells, these epithelial cells, and we're starting to realize, man, 15 to 30%, depending on what part of the gut you're in, 15 to 30% of that huge membrane is not composed of epithelial cells that are absorbing food. They're actually cells that are sensing, getting direction from the bacteria in your gut to make serotonin or not make serotonin. If you disrupt that membrane, if you start to disrupt and damage that membrane, those cells start to dysfunction completely and can't make serotonin, can't connect to the neurons that are in your gut lining, sending serotonin signal and serotonin itself up into the brain. That is such an important point. I'm going to stop you right there because that one right there needs uh, several underlinings and about 14 exclamation points because that is, is so absolutely relevant. And, and if you actually imagine, you painted the picture so uh, delightfully clear. I mean, you actually see what the communication network is. And one of the things we've talked a little bit about here is brain-derived neurotropic factor. And what you're, what's happening is those microbiome guys that are running around, all those individuals that are in there who are living, they're not parasites with us. They're actually keeping us alive and functioning, sending signals that actually encourage. Now, tell me this, because I've got a little bit of the knowledge so they actually stimulate brain-derived neurotropic factor. Yes. That, and that brain-derived neurotropic factor, does that take place in those lining cells? That's right, yeah. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. And so you got these epithelial endocrine cells. And so um, in the literature, these are called EEC cells or epithelial-derived endocrine cells. And these cells um, look... Uh, very much like the, epi the little ba barrier cells next to them, except they have a long projection underneath the barrier. And that long projection then communicates with uh, these glial cells, which are neurons that are floating around in the gut lining. And that's where you get the BDNF or, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And so serotonin being produced, a number of other transmitters in the EEC, they hit that glial cell, the glial cell is going to upregulate the BDNF and all of that. That is so interesting, isn't it? I mean, to think about that, and you, you know, how does one ever even think about it? You know, uh, I was interested in, in terms of the way I was, I got a little bit into Candida, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and the whole business of the communication for biofilm between the Candida uh, guys and how they're actually talking to each other. And, and this is even more um, minuscule, more my, uh, neurophysiologic, I don't know what the word would be. It's just, it's a smaller, smaller scale that we're, you're talking about. Yeah. Um, on a yeah. subsided level. And, and it's, it is a fascinating thing. Those, those biofilms that you refer to, we often re talk about them in the pathologic state, candida or the famous one, Lyme, uh, the Lyme spirochete that can make these biofilms. And we think, oh, we got to break up these biofilms. We got to kill that stuff. In reality, the coral reef of your gut relies heavily on the existence of these biofilms. Uh, all of the high, healthy microbiome can contribute to a very cool layer of film over top of your gut lining that actually acts as another neural system. It's, it's 
it's truly getting ridiculous where we're starting to realize there's so much communication going across the human body. We used to think that the brain and the neurons were how we communicated. Then we, then the endocrine system developing. Wow, these hormones can talk all over the place here, regardless of the neural system. And then, wow, we got pheromones that actually go outside of our body and talk to you. And you know, we got all of this external. And then we said, oh my gosh, the fascia underneath the skin has this incredible network of electrical communication. And oh my gosh, the gut lining itself has the bacterial biofilms. It has this communication network that functions as a neuron transmitting potassium electron potential across large distances from one bacteria to another your body if healthy is a massive communication system and that's really the conclusion of the matter if you have disorder or disease or if you're at risk for it you are inherently having a breakdown in, in probably three or five of these communication networks not just one isn't that interesting and this does segue to the question that i'm going to ask you in just a moment because what a wonderful foundation for the next piece of this conversation. And that is, how do we get to restore? What does it do? How do you plug some of those holes effectively and take care of business? Folks, we're going to be back in just a minute. We're going to take a little break from our sponsors. And we're going to get Dr. Bush to tell us about a way to do something about that arcane set of challenging variables that he just described. Back in just a moment. Well, folks, you know as well as I do that psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medication trials and those very, very brief hospitalizations, may prove insufficient to deal at home with the complexity of troubled children and, and those adolescents from 6 to 17 years old. Improved care, those next mandatory steps, should include a more comprehensive approach to address those multiple levels of challenges, from family to peers to school diagnostically from defiance to depression on every level for families, including military families internationally. The Barry Robinson Center's 32-acre open college-like campus in Norfolk, Virginia, provides safety and security and clean, comfortable living. How do we know? We refer folks over there all the time, strongly endorse what they're doing. So for further information and informed interview, connect at this page, barryrobinson.org forward slash Core. Well, you folks already know that here at Core Brain Journal, we're on a mission to introduce you to resources that make significant contributions to the investigation of those predictable mind science applications. Our colleagues at DHA Lab Group provide a real difference with treatment options for people at every level, from first awareness of mind problems to those frustrating times when even well-informed treatment becomes surprisingly unpredictable. For my entire professional life, from psychoanalysis to brain scans, I've searched for, yes, improved predictability. The good news for all of us, from professionals to patients, remarkably effective research offers useful, cost-effective, organic options far beyond guesswork with psychiatric medications alone. DHA lab tests measure unbalanced biomedical details through easily available testing now available globally for a variety of molecular answers from, for example, methylation, copper, and cryptopyrrole challenges. Check in for more details at dhalab.com core. That's d-h-a-l-a-b.com forward slash core. Well, Zach, we're back, and I can't tell you how much I enjoy listening to you. You're so articulate, and you've got the language down so exceptionally clear. And I appreciate the fact that you take the time to give us the visuals. I mean, we don't have a picture, but you say it so articulately and so comprehensively. It's like we're swimming around in the gut with these guys, pointing at them and talking about them while you and I are innocently talking across the state of Virginia. It's, it's pretty amazing. So take a moment before we get too much further along in this conversation and tell us about how you came to that next step. Folks, I was telling Dr. Bush one of the reasons I was so excited about having him come on because I had a, a dramatic, remarkable change with a person that I've been treating in my best quote unquote functional medicine, comprehensive psychiatry look at her. She was really psychotic when she came in with milk and I thought I was doing a great job when I got that taken care of. Then I discovered other levels of problems with uh, methylation, copper imbalances and hormones. And then she came in one day and she was dramatically better and she'd been on a product called Restore. I'm like, what in the heck is Restore? I hadn't heard about it before. 
And uh, so then I began ch chasing it down. And that's one of the reasons I asked Dr. Bush to come on because the fact that this patient of mine that I've been working with for a long time in a lot of different ways got so dramatically better in such a short period of time. I said, I've just got to get this, this guy on so we can talk and he can share with us what that restore does regarding these various uh, possible broken dysregulation uh, communication networks. How does it actually work? Very good. I, you know, the, again, if, if I start answering that question, you're going to think I'm intelligent. So I want to back up for a moment and really point out that all of this was found by accident. And so, um, you know, it's really, you can't invent a paradigm shift. <laughs> paradigm shifts happen to you. <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. you know, and so this was a huge paradigm shift, not just for me, but just, you know, for you now in your practice for, We've got thousands of clinics across the world that are using this as a frontline management tool in their patient care, and we've got you know, hundreds of stores across the country. It's just been a revolution out there. And so the paradigm shift that's happened started really actually by the speed that you just mentioned. So you've got a patient who's been suffering for, for eight, 10 years from you know, major depression, then psychosis, and then came out of psychosis, still having depression, anxiety, sleep problems, you know, the works. And then suddenly you start some random liquid product that they swallow a teaspoon here and there a few times a day. And two weeks later, they are a new person. Well, this started happening in my clinic. We developed this. We, I'll talk to you about what it is and how we came about it. But it was this fact that somebody could have that remarkable of a response. And in, in the case of my clinic, we were seeing people that were 60, 70, 80 years old that had literally had six decades of dis disorder suddenly shifting to a healthy paradigm in days not weeks yeah and so this this defied our understanding of biochemistry and cell biology the neural processes that have to develop the the decay of the neural system in the temporal lobe the side of your brain off near your ear there to create major depression anxiety and psychosis should it takes years and years to develop and as we know from medications and our experience with people with psychosis and they're in and out of psych hospitals and the whole, it takes years and years to back them out of that. So what the heck could possibly underlie a revolution in health that could happen in days, not weeks, not months, not years. Yeah. And so that's the paradigm shift that we stumbled ourselves upon. And now it's taken us the last few years to really untangle what is the biology of health. And the cool story here is that health happens way faster than disease. And that's encouraging because we are one sick puppy as a nation. Yes. We are collapsing in human health. We currently have one in two adults in the United States suffering from major depression at some point in their adult life. So the, the lifetime prevalence of depression at one in two is in contrast to 1900, 1920, when Freud and his colleagues were really at the forefront of of epidemiology and, and science and uh, population medicine, and they had found that the, the rate of major depression in the Europe and the U.S. was around 1 in 100. So we went from 1 in 100 humans with major depression to 1 in 2 with lifetime prevalence of this condition in just a short 50, 60-year period. And so disease has happened to the vast majority of the population, and so it's good news that the health happens even faster. So to give you a sense of kind of what we found, uh, we started again with nutrition. Um, nutrition, of course, was a situation where I was starting to learn that, oh man, if you could get nutrient density in the body, if you get lots of nutrients in there, you could do some really cool stuff. So there's a lot of literature from the 70s and 80s and 90s in the last century there that we had learned that, oh my gosh, we could do like a plant-based diet, we could do juicing, we could do, you know, low fat diets, low sugar diets, we're starting to really realize there's lots of ways to modify the diet to change the human course of health or disease. And so we dived into that and decided we we're going to do a plant-based diet. There was a ton of science around this, a lot of large population studies, lots of anecdotal information, and some good basic science on how nutrients from plants could cure anything. So we set out in 2010, and we started juicing everybody. I, I'm kind of an extremist, and so when I say I'm going to juice, it's like four pounds of kale for everybody. <laughs> And so we were trying to turn everybody green with the amount of superfoods we were pounding into them. And we saw something amazing that for about a third of those people, we'd see this immediate, uh, remarkable transformation. Blood sugars would be getting better. Cholesterol would drop. They'd test, chest pains would go away. Start to really improve. Then there was a third that would just kind of maybe start to improve, but then plateau and be stuck. And then there was a third that on health food were getting sicker. 
inflammation going up, feeling more bloating, more mood disorder, more fatigue, more aching in the morning. That was the group that led to the paradigm shift. What could possibly happen that would allow health food to become a, a disorder, to allow health food to actually accelerate inflammation and the decline of the human body? So it's that group that started asking us questions about the food itself. Is there something that's happened to the kale that's making it ineffective in these patients? Well, now taking a look at kale, we're starting to realize, whoa, the nutrients really have changed in food from 1950 to today. Uh, tomato, for example, lycopene, this incredible anti-cancer compound in tomatoes, tomatoes were supposed to be rich in this stuff. And now you go to a hydroponically grown tomato on the shelf of a typical grocery store and there's hardly a trace amount of lycopene in there. So clearly there was a drop in the medicinal features of our food, which then led us to say, well, where, why is that? They must be getting the nutrients from the soil. So we went and one of my colleagues pulled this 90 page white paper on soil science and dirt. I was kind of shocked that anybody had spent their career to write 90 pages about dirt. I'd actually never seen a 90 page white paper. So I'm tearing through this thing. I'm late to a patient in clinic. And, and then like on page 40, uh, this is 2012, suddenly see a molecule that looked a heck of a lot like the three dimensional structures that I had been working with, uh, with chemotherapy. And so the aha moment was, wow, for thousands of years, we've been looking to plants as me medicines, herbs, you know, herbal medicine, and then most of the drugs we, we make are like Bing Christie and the chemotherapy I used to work with and things like this. That's just made by plants all the time. We grow up a bunch of algae or plants and make them grow uh, alkaloids for us and we turn that into chemotherapy. So old age old thought that you know, plants have medicine in them. Whoa, what if dirt has medicine in it? Maybe the place the plant gets the medicine is in the dirt. And so this was a huge shift for me to think, yeah. whoa. And then maybe this is why we're having a drop in health in the plants, therefore a drop in health in the humans. We stop taking care of the dirt. And that's exactly what ends up happening is this story is actually one not so much of a collapse of human health. It was it began with a collapse of dirt health. We took our soil and the rich top soils of the earth and we turned them into dead dirt. And we did that through laziness. By and large, we just lacked the care and the, and the effort to take care of the soils we had for thousands of years in, in farming. Even if you're a small scale gardener, you know a lot about compost. The power of taking your food scraps and putting that into a compost pile and aerating and let the worms take over, get the bacteria in there and the fungi start growing in there and suddenly you got this vital black soil coming out of food scraps. That composting was an age old farming practice until the early 1900s when we were just trying to tear up as much land as possible and turn it into farmland and we weren't respecting the soil and so we actually developed what we now refer to as the dust bowl that wiped out the agricultural system of all of America through the 1930s. That dust bowl was a death of the topsoil. With that we had massive starvation. In the United States of America we had massive starvation in the 1930s. Just 80 years ago this country was starving from a lack of food. We had killed our soil. We forget about that. We get lazy with our history. Your great-grandparents, great your grandparents were dying of starvation or they knew somebody who was starving because of a lack of soil health. So we had to stop relying on big farms at that point. We started regrowing our own backyard gardens. So by the time World War II kicked in, we were growing a lot of our food again because we had to. And so people were nurturing these little gardens in their backyard and they were eating out of their garden. They were subsistence living. And then the war happened and we needed to get food to the troops all over the world. And so now people had to really be demanding their own gardens. So we all tripled the size of the gardens and we called them victory gardens. There was a huge PR campaign for gardens. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. everybody was supposed to grow a victory garden and you know, do it for the troops. The troops need the food that we're growing on the planet. We, we need to get the chickens to them. We need to get the crops to them to so grow your own food. Victory Garden. By the end of World War II, Americans was growing 45% of their food chain in their backyards. Is that right? Today, we are growing less than one-tenth of one percent oh my gosh. in our backyard gardens. And so what we're about to talk about in the next few minutes about factory farming, I want you to keep in mind that you and I created that. Mm. You and I, by outsourcing our food production again, which has happened in the past, we have outsourced our food and therefore we have demanded that farmers adapt chemical farming to grow enough food for everybody. One farmer is now growing food for tens of thousands of families. Well, that's a wrong ratio. That was not how this thing was supposed to happen. 
And so the solution at the end of this thing is going to largely be getting you back outside, get at the very least, even if you live in the inner city, grow one plant. In your window, grow a basil plant, grow a tomato. If you really are terrible and you just feel like you kill everything you touch, grow mint. It's bulletproof. <laughs> and so, yeah. so and true. go after a plant. So then what happened? How did the, you know, I'm looking at the time. This is such an interesting thing. I mean, I love hearing the entire evolution of it because you don't know this about me, but I'm a non-recovering organic gardener who <laughs> who is such a sick workaholic that I can't get out and do it anymore. But we've done it for years, keeping bees and, and doing organic gardening. I was, I was doing it for, for many, many years. And we are strong, strong supporters of the compost, the worms, and the whole thing. But back to it. We unfortunately, Zach, we have just a few minutes left, and we're going to have to put some stuff on the show notes here. But give us a quick summary of what that restore does to that gut lining and to that whole uh, space between the cells and all that. So we can just get a little picture of that. I'm right now officially act, asking you back. I mean, this is such an interesting, it's got to be phase one for another conversation. Right. Uh, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit because I know your time is limited. But I think, you know, what you've done is set up uh, our listeners uh, for, and myself, of course, for uh, how do we really take it down? If this is the background that we're dealing with and the reality of our lives right now, what do we do with all of these suffering individuals that have this whole starting with the gut serotonin problem, which is pervasive, treatment failure with psych meds? What do we actually do with them and how do we take it to the next level to actually restore some of those, some of those uh, challenging uh, detours that have taken place? So the, the secret ends up being right back in that soil. So if we go back 50 million years ago, which is what we now do with our laboratories, we extract the carbon molecules that are made by bacteria and fungi as a communication network. So we've talked a lot about the importance of communication and cellular function the bacteria and fungi make these molecules that we discovered back in 2012. Those molecules, when put into a large population and variety, each species of bacteria and fungi making their own subset of these carbon snowflakes, when you put those into play, they act as the wireless communication network between the whole system. And mm. so the bacteria themselves, the fungi talking to the bacteria, the bacteria talking to the viruses, all of this, but more importantly, the bacteria talking to those endocrine cells that will now make serotonin. The, the bacteria speaking directly through this, this communication network to the nucleus within your endothelial cells to make more of the tight junctions, these incredible Velcro-like proteins that make that whole cellophane layer of your gut lining intact and intelligent. All the way through to the immune system, the bacteria are actually telling the immune system how to upregulate antioxidants so that when the immune system is stimulated, it can address that oxidative stress for the immune system with an antioxidant response from glutathione and other things. And so we find out that the bacteria and fungi are actually regulating the entire gut and therefore the entire brain. Wow. It's a fascinating reality that if you take an antibiotic today, you just took away the front line of defense and weakened a couple layers deeper of gut health, therefore your brain health. And so it's not unusual for you to develop a major depression or anxiety or sleep disorder within two weeks of you starting an antibiotic. Mm. The main antibiotic you eat is not from your doctor. The main antibiotic you consume on a daily basis is called glyphosate, which is Roundup. Roundup, that wheat killer that we genetically modified our corn, soybean, beets, etc., to handle. So now we're spraying our entire fields of food with a chemical that actually functions not as a weed killer, as an antibiotic, as an antifungal, as an antiparasite. It kills every single celled organism it can find, and it kills the plants. We genetically modify our corn and soybeans so they can resist this thing and survive long enough to turn out an ear of corn. But that ear of corn is now full of that chemical that has blocked its ability to make nutrient, and it's now growing in a soil that's devoid of bacteria and fungi and lacking that communication network. So it restores this incredible experience of reintroducing what the soil had for millions of years and then humans came along and wiped it out in a short hundred years. So we're just giving back the intelligence of a communication network between bacteria and fungi, fungi in the gut, the gut and the brain, giving back that foundation of health. It's an extraordinary journey back into nature and finding out that Mother Earth is profoundly graceful. Here we are dumping 
now somewhere around four and a half billion pounds of glyphosate and Roundup into our soils worldwide. We are killing our soil. And Mother Earth had the, the kindness and the gentleness to say, well, 50 million years ago, we're going to plant in there the antidote to that Roundup. Mm -hmm. We're going to put into the soil something that when you make your biggest mistake and you kill the very soil you live by, here's your antidote. It is soil. It's a gift from the bacteria and the fungi. That's what we found in Restore, and it's been an extraordinary, humbling journey since then. Un doggone believable, I'm telling you. You know, you still are actually, and I, I'm sorry to bug you about this because I don't know you personally, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but I do want you back. I mean, because really, you just set us up for, for, you know, volume two. I mean, really, we're just now... And I think if you could say some more about that at a later date, because we're just right here at a time where I've got a, I've got a run, unfortunately. And Zach, before we leave, I'm sorry to cut you off, but tell us where we can reach you. I'm going to have all this in, uh, in the show notes, but if we hear it from you, then they'll drive back to the show notes because you just came right to the point here about what we need to do about it. And we need just a little more information about where we can connect, that's through your website, and how we can take this to the next level. So, Absolutely. So uh, on the product Restore, the website is restore4life.com, restore4life.com, and then for more science and more of my lectures and, and more discussion and podcasts and everything else, uh, you can go to Zach, Z-A-C-H, Bush, B-U-S-H, M-D.com. Zach, we're going to have you back, buddy. I mean, I'm going to do what I can to manipulate you to do it. I know you're <laughs> Thanks, busy. I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on board because this has been, and actually, folks, what I'm going to do is put a video that's going to be somewhat um, helpful in terms of the explanation. So when you go there, you'll have a little more from Zach. Thank you so much, Zach. You have a good evening. Best of health to all of you. You too, buddy. See you. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications, like those written for ADHD, are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.